The Green Party of Canada has been around for almost four decades, but it was only under outgoing leader Elizabeth May that it elected a member of parliament. They now have a caucus of three, and since Ms. May is stepping aside as leader, they're looking for someone that can keep and build on the gains under her leadership. They have no shortage of contenders. There are 10 candidates vying to take the reins. In the interest of actually hearing from each properly, we've split this into two debates. Five contenders tonight, five tomorrow. And with that, we welcome, in alphabetical order, in Clemensport, Nova Scotia, Judy Green, a Canadian Armed Forces veteran and the party's candidate in West Nova in last year's federal election. In Vancouver, British Columbia, Amita Kuttner, an astrophysicist and the party's critic for science and innovation for the past two years. In Saanich, British Columbia, David Murner, lawyer and the Green candidate last year in Esquimalt Saanich Sook. In Winnipeg, Manitoba, Glenn Murray, former mayor of Winnipeg and a former Ontario Minister of the Environment, among other portfolios. And here in Ontario's capital city, Annami Paul, lawyer, social entrepreneur and the Green candidate in Toronto Centre in last year's election. And we are delighted to welcome half of the people who are running for the leadership of the Green Party of Canada. And I want to start just by saying uh, we're obviously dispensing with sort of official debate rules here. There's no opening statement so that we're going to dive right into it and we'll do the best we can to make sure everybody gets equal time tonight. Let me put this premise out here and then we'll dive into this. When people think Liberal Party of Canada or New Democratic Party of Canada or Conservative Party of Canada, they have a sense where those parties are on the political spectrum and therefore some sense about what they're voting for when they vote. Where do you see the Green Party under your leadership fitting into that political spectrum? We know where it's been under Elizabeth May. I guess we want to find out how different mm -hmm. you would make the party if you were in charge. Judy Green, start us off, please. Awesome. Thank you for that question. We often get asked whether we're left or right or where we fall on the spectrum. And I think that we have evolved past a simple left or right. There's something called an axial shift, which actually takes into account um, issues of social responsibility and how well our people are doing. It, it fits well into the wellness economy. And I really like that um, approach much better than a simple left or right, because really the Green Party is about finding the best solution for the problems we have. And that solution may come from anywhere along that spectrum. It, we really have to be um, solution focused and long term uh, thinkers in terms of really fixing the problems, not just putting Band-Aids on them. I mean, so how you. would you answer that? Well, I definitely think that I am socially left and would like to see the party be squarely socially left. But in terms of economic policy, I believe what we're bringing forward is something entirely new, something that's being brought up across the world, especially now even in Europe, like circular economies and stuff like that. So it's going to be up to a, con up to a conversation with every community to see how that definition works on their political spectrum, which I think now has more dimensions than just two. David. I see us as Greens who are the most progressive party in Canada. We fought inequality. It's in our DNA. We were the first party to endorse equal marriage. You know, we're the first party to have a serious guaranteed livable income program to eliminate poverty in Canada. So we're very progressive, but we're also fiscally responsible. We, we cost every promise we make. We tell people how we're going to pay for it. So we combine the best of all worlds. I don't see us as just being left or right. I see us as looking at policy that's deeply transformative, solutions that work for Canadians. It's not about left or right for us. Enemy. Uh, thank you, Steve. And you know, welcome everyone to my hometown, Ontario. First of all, I wanted to give those greetings. You know, I love getting asked this question, Steve, because the, the reasons are very clear to me. And I believe that particularly because of the pandemic where Canadians are going to be asking themselves that question and looking at our party with fresh eyes. And what they're going to see is a party that is extremely, as David said, progressive. Uh, we are very progressive. We are interested in creating a more just and sustainable society. We are also extremely collaborative, and Canadians have seen how important that's been in terms of the the uh, the pandemic and getting things done quickly and getting relief to people. And so, you know, looking at a party that that has that as as its modus operandi, that really believes in that and wants to reinforce that throughout our political system, I think is absolutely something that sets us apart. And the thing that I'm most excited about, and we talk about a lot in our campaign, is daring. 
we are the party that pushes the discussion forward. We are the party that introduces those new ideas into the political discourse. And, you know, we need that more than ever now. We need that more than ever. And uh, if Canadians want to see more of that, uh, then they'll be looking at us. And I think that really sets us apart. Glenn Murray, where on the political spectrum do you see the Glenn, the, um, the Glenn Murray-led Green Party? Let's put it that way. Well, you know, I, I think we we span from green capitalists, uh, people who would be in the Tom Rand kind of philosophical world, the Toby Heaps, uh, to uh, eco-socialists and everything in between. But what differentiates us from that isn't a left-right split, because I think we're a big tent party in that sense, is that we're the only party that totally embraces a circular economy, uh, a, a, an economy which... Uh, reuses and repurposes materials that is completely committed to renewables. It's not just recycling for us or clean energy. It's a complete shift from an economy built on uh, resource extraction to one built on recovery and the inclusion and priority of wellness as the outcome. Uh, and that makes us dramatically different than the other parties. Let's dive deeper Steve, on that. Steve, um, if I could just jump in for a second. I'm sure. sorry, it's the obvious thing, and sometimes Greens forget it because it's so obvious to us. But what sets us apart from all of the other political parties more than anything else is our commitment to the climate and our commitment to targets that are that correspond with the science. We are the only party in Canada that has set targets that correspond to what we have been told uh, we need to reach if we're going to avoid the worst uh, impacts of, uh, of, of the climate uh, change that we're seeing. Well, let's dive deeper Sorry, on that so right now. Let, let, me, let me put a question to all of you right now. And um, Amita, why don't we get you to start on this one? The skies of our major cities right now are remarkably pollution-free these days. We know this. We can see it, we feel it, and there's evidence to back it up. That's perhaps one of the very few good things that this pandemic has delivered. But how do we take that positive development and run with it? When safety suggests, and here's what I'm getting at here, more people may drive their cars in future because they're afraid to get on transit. More people are going to be using single-use plastic because when they bring their reusable bags to go to the supermarket, they're not allowed to use them anymore. They get handed those plastic bags for fear of spreading the virus. Help us understand how we take this moment in time and run with it. Amita, you first. Thank you, Steve. It's so important that we actually embrace this moment because I think people have actually seen how precarious so many people's lives are and how much just a little shift can actually send everybody over the edge and thus that need for absolute transformation of our economy, of our societies to a place where we really care about each other is necessary. But what I find is interesting about those exact things, so the plastic bags and even the reduction in pollution, it's shown us on the pollution side how clean it can become quickly, but those things are also small. We haven't actually seen a significant reduction in our emissions across the planet, which is really what's going to be driving disaster. So we need to use this moment when everyone sees how our lives have become somewhat dystopian to bring forward that concept of a future where we can actually bring about the change necessary to confront climate change and also bring everybody into a more just, equitable way of living. David, how about you next? Yeah, I'd just like to pick up on Amita's answer. They're right when they say we are at the right time for deep transformational solutions to the problems we face, and we need to seize the moment. People are calling out for deep change, and what they get from the old line parties is incremental steps, small change. But we're, we're a party that's really deeply based in evidence. You wouldn't believe the number of engineers and scientists, even on this panel that we have. And so let's take the evidence-based solutions. We're now listening to the public health doctors we never used to. Let's listen to the climate scientists. Let's listen to the experts who say, we can make deep change in our society, in our economy, in how our government works, in how our social programs work. You know, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit is another example. It's not working very well for everybody, bring in the guaranteed livable income because we know that can work. We've seen the pilot projects. So I agree, this is a time for deep change. And the Greens, the one thing that distinguishes us is we've always advocated change for the next generation and seven generations down the road based on evidence. And I think that's a really compelling offer to Canadians and also around the world. We can build something new uh, if we just listen to some of these leading edge Green Party policies. Glenn Murray, how do we take advantage of this moment? Well, I, I think we, we have to 
do new things, but we have to get back to what was working. Um, Ontario, where you're sitting, Steve, just was probably breaking about a 20% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, not over the 2005, but over 1990 with cap and trade, with the closure of coal plants. We still have provinces that haven't closed coal plants. We hardly have a province or a working carbon pricing system. The federal carbon tax is a joke. Our, our, you know, when Ontario's EV programs and Quebec EV and cap and trade programs were either stalled or canceled, we jumped 15 megatons in one year. We need to get people elected <laughs> who know how to design these programs quickly and get them back on track. We are going so quickly in the other direction. It's not funny. We, we have to be... Uh, we have eight years to stabilize our climate, uh, cap growth and GHG emissions and bring them down. Fortunately, that gives us, if we do the circular economy model, which circular economy is a commitment to zero emissions and zero waste, we can get there. But Canada has gone in the last three years from being a major leader in the world to being a global lagger. And only the Greens, you know, as my colleagues would all have all been saying, is the only party that gets this anymore and is committed to it. Judy, to you next. I agree with, with my fellow panelists, you know, incremental change is not going to solve the problems. We're seeing with COVID-19 that we're only getting small reductions and they're only temporary in CO2 emissions. We need to go after those big emitters. We have to, I mean, this is what got me into politics in, in the last election is that I recognized that we have to use political will to um, enforce regulations that are going to help us meet these targets. And the Greens are the only ones who have targets and a plan to get there, even more importantly. You know, we need to be looking at sequestering carbon. It's not a single, it's not a, a, a silver bullet, one thing that's going to fix the issues that face us. We have to be sequestering carbon. We have to be uh, using um, regenerative techniques in farming. We need to be really over like reshaping our our forestry it's not about you know the fiber that comes off the land it's about how much that value those uh, forestry areas are or forested areas are sequestering carbon that we simply cannot afford to release into the atmosphere right now so it is a, a broad spectrum and i think that's something people don't understand about the green party platform is that we have solutions for everything across the board and it's not just a single um, issue. So we can do it. We have a plan. We Enemy. just need to get into Parliament. <laughs> Enemy, let's get you on this one. You know, it's, it's an excellent question. And we, we might not have an opportunity like that, this for a long time. I just heard last night from some Greens that I was speaking to, you know, they said in, that are in their 60s and 70s that they have never seen a moment like this. And so you're absolutely right. The question is, how do we harness it? And this is where this is where government comes in. This is where political parties come in. You know, we have been we've been slowly over time, drip, 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 taught to think small, think small, think small, think, you know, in, in, in micro targeting. And really what we need to be doing now is building a grand vision for the country. We have seen through the pandemic that it is possible for different levels of government to cooperate. We've seen how much good comes out of collaboration. And really that is the direction that we need to be headed in. And I agree with uh, the other panelists that, um, you know, the Green Party is the and choosing the Green Party is the single best thing that people in Canada can do if they want to see that grand vision um, implemented. And so, you know, I, I look to the European Union. I spent many years working in the European Union for our government and other multilaterals, and I see their EU Green Deal, I see their carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism. Um, Glenn, I think we moved on a bit perhaps from cap and trade, uh, and I see the future. And so if they can do it, Canadians can do it. People in Canada are up to the job. They just need it articulated uh, by their leaders. And this is where leadership matters the most. Well, since you mentioned Glenn Murray, I should give him a chance to come back on that because he was the environment minister in Ontario that brought in the cap and trade plan that the Ford government subsequently canceled. Uh, Glenn Murray, do you think the time for cap and trade has come and gone? No, I, I think it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Cap and trade is the only system that works. The European systems aren't working. Um, California and Quebec are still on track. Quebec, Ontario, and California, because what cap and trade gives you, it's a legislated cap. Ontario was coming down at 4.3% per year. So what you get with cap and trade is you get a guaranteed reduction. 
because you're, you basically have built a carbon budget, which is what we need to do, and you reduce that by 4.3% per year, making it impossible for anyone to emit greater than that. What, what a carbon tax like the Canadian ones have just gives you price certainty. It sets the tax. And no legislature has been prepared to raise it to the 40, 50, 60, 70 or dollars a ton necessary to have an impact because the only impact it has. Uh, so, but like Glenn, I mean, Glenn, uh, would we say that that's a question? Wouldn't we say, Glenn, that that's a question of leadership as opposed to a question of what works best? I mean, we have a general consensus amongst economists against Nobel Prize winning economists that a carbon tax is the cheapest, most efficient way um, when compared to cap and trade and other means uh, to actually get to our target. So are we really getting back to the main thing, which is the leadership that's needed in order to uh, convince Canadians that this really is the best and cheapest option for them? Show me a tax system in the world that's working and show me any system that was more effective than the Quebec, Ontario, California cap and trade system. Nobody was reduced. Let me finish. I, let, let, you, let me just finish. And that's not enough because you need a legislative cap. You also need mandates right now. To get to switch our fleet off electric vehicles, we are going to have to mandate, as we did going into the Second World War, and, and as we did with coal plant closures, we're going to have to limit the number of, of um, internal combustion engine vehicles that can be sold every year. We've got to get to Z mandates. We have to do a lot more. We have to legislate the shift in technologies. We only have 10 years. But there isn't a tax system in the world that came close to the success of the California, Quebec, Ontario system. There was just simply the one that achieved those results. Let me hear from the other three of you on this. David, uh, we, we have the federal carbon tax that's in place right now. We hear conservatives talking about getting there via regulation. We've heard about cap and trade. There are other ideas out there as well. What do you like? Well, it's ironic that the conservatives are talking about regulation because that seems to go against the whole idea. The great thing about cap and trade and the carbon tax is that you're setting a pricing mechanism and that's what we need to do. Uh, I think that Glenn is right. We need a comprehensive solution. I, I, I actually agree with Hanami as well that putting a price on carbon is essential to getting there. But it's way beyond that. We need to transform the way our economy works. We need to create the largest job creation uh, program in Canadian history through the Green New Deal. We need to build an east-west electrical grid across our country, powered by renewables. And we need to make a just transition where no one's left behind from fossil fuels to renewables. So we need to talk about a big, comprehensive uh, solution to this problem. It's not about whether one little change or another is better. It's about how do we make big transformational change in something where the scientists are telling us we only have five or six or seven years to go before the global climate emergency becomes irreversible. So it's time for action on all fronts. It's time for all hands on deck right now. Amita, can I get you to weigh in on this? Yeah, so I think everybody has brought up really important points, but we're actually missing the core of it, which is we don't have seven or eight years. We have zero. And I speak from a scientific perspective here, and I love the conversation about evidence-based policy, but generally we really don't actually see anything that's evidence-based. And if we look at what's going on across the entire planet right now, there's already destruction. And I've been through it myself. I lost my mother and my house in a mudslide. And so I'm watching everyone across this planet suffer already. It's not seven years. It's every single minute we can possibly get to do everything we can. So I agree, it's going to take more than one method. But we have to work together and we have to be aware that we are actually in a position of privilege based on where we are in the world in terms of direct climate impacts. That it's far worse and we have a responsibility with our prosperity to do as much as we can, as fast as we can. Judy. Yes, I, I agree. Uh, carbon tax is uh, just one tool in the toolkit. And we don't have time to have this incremental change. And we have to have the political will. We have cap and trade in Nova Scotia. And they, they really fumbled the ball. Because what they did is the top three emitters, they gave them their carbon, carbon credits for free for four years. So that's delaying us from actually reaching those targets in four years. So the political will has to be there. The understanding has to be there. I hear conversations from, from our political leaders who don't truly understand how carbon pricing even works. And that, that is, these people are making the decisions. And that's terrifying. When we don't have time to play these games, we have to, to have a fully fleshed out plan and we have to get started on it now, preferably a year ago.
or four years ago or 10 years ago, but we have to do what we can now. And that means everything. That means all hands on deck and there's no pussyfooting around any longer. Can I ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring that five shot back up so I can see everybody at once and perhaps through a show of hands, is there anybody here who thinks we need more pipelines in the country? <laughs> Any show of hands. Okay, that's an O for five, right? We have no pipeline supporters on this group right at all. Okay, understood. In which case, I'm not even going to waste time on that question because uh, if, there's nothing, if there's nothing to debate, there's nothing to debate. Let's move on. The liberals and new Democrats, they would say, had serious environmental planks in their last election <laughs> platforms. Have they become green enough the conservatives are a different story. Uh, for whatever reason, polls have suggested that, that the public didn't see them as having a serious uh, environmental policy on climate change. Do you think those parties have become green enough to make you redundant? Uh, go ahead, Glenn Murray, start us off. No, they're, they're you look at them all from BC, the green, the, the NDP particularly, uh, have, are now one of the parties that's contributing to major greenhouse gas emissions in supporting fossil fuels. I mean, you've got, I mean, the project that they're supporting in BC uh, is going to do more, create more pollution than the $2.8 billion the Ontario Conservatives are putting into gas pool. And, and I, I think what's, we know what works now. I mean, what New Zealand is doing works to a, an extent. Norway has a huge 20 plus sales tax on internal combustion engines, so they can do that. But if you're not prepared to have a high carbon tax, a very high one, or a cap and trade system, which which can deliver the same results at 15, 20, 25 dollars a ton, that takes 60 or 80 or 100 dollars a ton to do that. We need systems that work. The only party that seriously is talking about workable systems that you could get elected on, because no one's going to get elected on a $300 carbon tax, that you need caps, you need a trade system, you need things that keep it affordable and work well in the economy. We know that now. We know California is working. We know the carbon tax jurisdictions are still seeing emissions go up. So the, and the NDP used to support cap and trade under Jack Layton. It was very popular when they did that. And part of the reason Jack supported it was because it's not just environmentally effective. You can get elected on a cap and trade system and you get better results with a cap and trade system. So I, I think we actually have to have, for an evidence-based party, we should look around the world and we should actually look at the evidence. And that the other one that works is fee and dividend. And it works very well as a complementary system, as a social equity model, as it does in California. And we need to be... We need to be hold ourselves to our own standard of evidence-based standard. We need something that could work. And Amita, we have to get way down. We, we should be 10, 20, 15 percent down within 10 years because the number I'm talking about in 10 years is we have to be carbon neutral long before 2050. And if we don't cap our emissions in the next couple of years, bring them down. I totally agree with your assessment. Australia lost a quarter of its forests. Syria has eight point. Oh, I think we have our, our first technical difficulty, which is amazing. We've lasted this long without one. We'll get back to Glenn Murray in a second. Obviously, in this era of COVID, we're using different kinds of technology here and stuff freezes up from time to time. Judy Green, do we still need the Greens? Because uh, the Liberals and New Democrats would say, we've got the in government, we've got the environment pretty well covered in our platforms. Well, they certainly talk the good talk, but, you know, actions speak a heck of a lot louder than words. And when push comes to shove, they cave in every single time. We've seen that over and over and over again, and we have to stop it. You know, uh, what they say, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. You know, the Greens are the only ones who've been consistent with, with their their message consistent with the solutions has been evidence-based, and we're ready to go. I feel like saying, you know, we're ready. Send us in, coach. <laughs> And Amy Paul, how about you? Uh, the Greens were done then at this point? You know, it is such an interesting question, and I actually did uh, a mental exercise about that when I was thinking about the Green Party when I was deciding whether to run or not. I said, if the Liberals and the NDP just swallow our climate policies whole, they just, they, they're converted, they've decided, they're, they're, they're on board, is there a reason for the Green Party to exist? And I believe absolutely there's a reason for the Green Party to exist, and I touched upon it before. It's really all about the fact that we are the ones that propose those policies that they, um, that they uh, absorbed. And that happens time and time and time again. Whether you're talking about the, the NDP's um, newfound, and we're very happy, I'm personally very happy, their newfound interest in guaranteed livable income, or um, you know the growing consensus around universal pharmacare, or plans for uh, tuition-free post-secondary education. 
It is the Greens that have put those ideas into the political discourse, and we do it based on evidence. We do it without fear, and we do it on behalf of people in Canada. We are the party that uh, that occupies that space. Um, it's unfortunate we're the only ones. I welcome and invite the other parties to join us there. But until there is another party that prioritizes the people first and the evidence-based policy first, there will always be a role for the Green Party in Canada. Amita, your view on that? I think this one is a bit tricky, and I'll start off by saying absolutely, there's a massive, important place for the Green Party. But I think to actually maintain our relevancy, we have to shift and shift back to our core and our values and everything else that we bring. And I say this because we saw in the last election, that was kind of the last time we were voting in Canada in a sort of preemptive way on climate. Now we see disasters here, like tornadoes and flooding. And we're at a point where just having climate policy isn't good enough. And we see that through the other parties. It's completely believable. And it makes sense that it's hard for us, for any person to differentiate climate policies and what's good enough when everyone is promising the same thing. So we actually now have the job of building a movement, returning to our core of ecological wisdom, of presenting this picture of the world where we can live for generations sustainably, looking after each other with, with high well-being, and come back to our core also of representation, of bringing people to government. And I think by showing ourselves to be unique from the other parties, as well as always being the leader on climate and the ones that can also be the best on response, we will have more than a place, but a place for government. David. The other parties promise real change, but they consistently deliver either small change or they do the opposite of what they said during their campaigns. We see that here in British Columbia with the NDP, they're pouring $6.6 .6 billion into the fossil fuel industries here into a market that actually isn't sustainable. They're logging more old growth forest here on Vancouver Island than under the Liberals. And it's the same thing with the federal Liberals. The Liberals have said, you, we will cut fossil fuel subsidies to zero. And now we are subsidizing fossil fuel companies more than any other country in the OECD uh, per capita. So it's shocking. And one of the things the Greens can say is, we do not do this. Environmental issues, ecological wisdom, these are core to our values. We are not going to break our promises. We're not going to say one thing and do the other. But more than that, we also, social justice is one of our core value. And we also have really well thought out plans, fully costed on how we leave no one behind when we make the transition off fossil fuels and onto renewables. We have those, those plans costed out by the parliamentary budget officer. They're very credible, serious plans. And I think Canadians are at the point, especially now in these times of COVID-19, to look at us in a new way, say, we need change. We need deep transformational solutions. And we just can't count on the old line parties to keep their word. So let's try the Greens. Give the Greens a chance. Okay, we're down to less than 10 minutes to go here. Time flies when you're having a good time. And I wanna see if we can get two more questions in before we're done. Perhaps, one of the biggest public policy issues that all of you, whoever wins this thing, will have to deal with in the future um, is to weigh in on this issue of whether to defund the police. And I know that means different things to different people. For some people, it means getting rid of the police services entirely. For others, it means taking that money that perhaps goes to police budgets now to have them respond to mental health issues and redirect it to others who uh, can perhaps more effectively answer those calls. Uh, Amita, why don't you start us off? Defund the police. Are you for it? Are you against it? What does it mean to you? I am absolutely for it, but its definition is definitely incredibly important. So I think it's also a long-term, not too long, but it's not an immediate thing. It's not an immediate process. So the first thing is to start deflecting funds towards health, towards education, towards community systems, because right now we see definitely overfunding of police. But there's something that that diversion of funds will never accomplish, and that is undoing of systemic racism, violence, and oppression. So I do think that we need to completely overhaul the system, completely break it down and apart, and rebuild different systems. So whether it be mental health professionals re responding to mental health calls or community safety organizations to make sure that everyone on the ground is safe. But it does not also deny the real fact that we have some violent crime 
But a lot of that is not by us, not by regular people. And so you may have to have a response force for that, but it cannot be one that is based in systemic racism. And it has to be apart from kind of regular life. Enemy Paul, what does defund the police mean to you? And do we need to do it? Thank you very much, Stephen. You know, this is something that touches Black Canadians uh, and Indigenous peoples overwhelmingly disproportionately. We are the two most overrepresented groups in the criminal justice system. Uh, we are the two groups that suffer most from excessive police use of force. And so it's something, of course, that is it's just a day-to-day -day reality uh, for me and for, for my community and for Indigenous peoples across the country. Um, I, I know that there are, are candidates, um, um, Amita among them and some others, who have called for abolishing the police. Um, I do not think that that is, um, that that is um, the, the right strategy. Uh, I, I know from personal experience, and, and many others will tell you, that uh, it may be a very small number or per percentage of the population, uh, but there are some very bad people doing some very predatory things, and there's no amount of community or social services that is going to stop them from doing that, and we want them off of the streets. And so what we need to do is just be very clear about what is the appropriate role for the police and what is the appropriate role for other types of social services. And if I can just give a couple of things that we can absolutely start with just today, there, there is no need to delay. We can adopt the recommendations of the United Nations Working Group on People of African Descent. Uh, the, um, their recommendations apply to Black Canadians. They also would apply to Indigenous peoples as well. Uh, and it is very comprehensive and it's the result of a lot of work in the community. And we can, and we have launched a petition in my campaign for a national database on police use of force so that we can get the data, the disaggregated data that we need to know how deep the problem is. We know that it is catastrophic, um, but the numbers need to come to light so that we can actually take the action that we need to. Okay, and David, finally, forgive me for Steve, jumping I, in. Sorry, enemy. For, for, I'll for, indulge myself for one more second just because of this issue. I will say that one of the most impactful things that people in Canada can do if they really care about this issue is to put Indigenous peoples and Black Canadians in positions of power so that we can talk for ourselves, so that we can implement the changes that are needed. The, the time for the listening is over. We have been very clear. It's time to allow us to take the action. Okay, let's go to David Murder next on this issue of defunding the police. Thanks, Steve. The Parliamentary Black Caucus has come up with a really good plan around police reform and how we fix uh, a broken justice system. This is not just about the police, it's about a justice system. And more fundamentally, it's about systematic, systematic racism in our society. But we can overcome this. We have plans, like the, the plan put forward by the Black Parliamentary Caucus, and I think that what we need is systematic change. I've worked inside the justice system for 28 years. I worked in human rights, I worked on indigenous justice, and I've seen this myself. We need a justice system that is open to deep change, which is about empowering multidisciplinary teams. So the police, when they go to a place where there's a mental health issue, are not the first ones there, unless there's violence and danger that's real danger to the mental health workers. We have a perfect example here in Victoria, British Columbia, assertive community treatment teams that work together and that make sure that the right person is doing the right job. Right now, we have too many silos in our justice system. We have too many silos in the way our government works. We need to focus on service to Canadians. And if we do this right, we can lead deep transformational change. That's what the Greens have always stood for, and it definitely applies here in addressing racism in Canada. Judy Green, to you, um, please. I'm, can I just push? No, no, no. Enemy, back. forgive me, forgive me. I, we're we're going to no. run out of time, and i got to make sure okay. everybody gets somewhat equal okay. time here. Judy Fair Green, up to, over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that we're actually dealing with multiple um, issues right here. You know, we're, we're dealing with um, so hor horrendous um, violence against, um, you know, people who are black, indigenous and, and people of color, and which are, are not excusable in any way, shape or form. We're dealing with um, a corporate culture within um, a very col colonial system. And that has to change. And I'm not convinced 
that we're going to root that out by having slow incremental changes. You know, we have to change the mindset from being reactionary, only dealing with things after the fact, having our police officers going out and expecting to be dealing with criminals, even when they're dealing with somebody who might be having a mental health crisis. They only have one tool in their toolbox, and that's not um, efficient. And it's not fair to put them in that position either, because we need to be doing these multidisciplinary teams. We need to be having social workers going to these wellness wellness um, calls. We need to be looking more at prevention within our communities as well. Guaranteed livable income, bringing people out of poverty, um, which reduces alcoholism and, and addictions. It, it um, it uh, keeps people in school, it uh, reduces crime, and we have the stats that back that up. So the way I see it is it needs to be a shift, and it will be defunding because those, those um, as we put money into these social supports, these preventative measures, then the police will be called on less and less in those communities, and so therefore the funding for them will be less necessary. And we absolutely have to stop militarizing our police. And I'm a veteran. I understand that there's a place, you know, to be able to defend ourselves. It is not in our police force. Uh, we do need we do need um, a rapid action to be uh, units to be able to address the violent crime that is still happening and will continue to happen, um, even with these these um, in place. But what it's going to do is it's going to make it more equitable so that we have far fewer people in, in prison and in the legal system simply because they come from um, a community or, or of lower means and don't have um, the supports and the privilege. Okay, that Judy, do. forgive me, I'm jumping in because we've literally got a minute left and I've got to give it to Glenn Murray to weigh in on this. The last minute to you, Glenn. So when I, when I was mayor, the policing budget was 20 percent in Winnipeg. It is now over 30 percent. Um, all other services, housing, parks, recreation, social support, social services, were 50 percent of the budget. They're now 35 percent. The New Deal for City, which I, I worked on, pushed massive amounts of money from the federal government to cities. But you've got to relocalize this. The best housing programs in Winnipeg were when the community ran them. We need community-based development corporations, social enterprise. We were we were we built six thousand affordable housing units, massively reduced crime, with a community-based policing model that was that used more health inspectors, social services folks, and building inspectors to enforce the law and bring civility. Decentralize government, put more money back in cities. I don't think you need a constitutional change because you'll never get it, but there's nothing stopping it. We were so close. We, we, we put five cent a liter gas tax. The federal government has to transfer tax revenue to cities and city governments have to give power back to those racialized minorities. School boards, community groups, let the communities run themselves. Toronto used to, under David Crombie, have neighborhood planning sessions and every neighborhood developed its plan and neighborhood corporations and social enterprise, not government run programs. Re-empower people, relocalize it, follow the philosophies of that great adopted Canadian Jane Jacobs. We know how to do this. We just have to fix it. So defund the police is more about let's restore funding to, to neighborhoods. Let's restore power to racialized communities. I did that very successfully when I was mayor, and it, it, we literally transformed neighborhoods. But we really didn't do it. When I said we, the people in the neighborhood do it. And those programs are destroyed. We're now into surveillance, policing, police helicopters, smart technology, cameras, face recognition. This stuff is costing us a small fortune, and it, it, it enhances racism and, and enhances colonialization. Friends, that's our time. Mr. Director, a five shot is exactly what I wanted, please, so we can thank Judy Green, Amita Kuttner, David Murner, Glenn Murray, and enemy Paul for joining us on TVO tonight. Good luck to all of you and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Now, just a little reminder here, the second debate among the other five candidates is already available at tvo.org slash the agenda and on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda. If you're watching on the live stream, we'll have that other debate right after this. Outgoing leader Elizabeth May fought hard to get the Green Party of Canada onto the spotlight on the federal stage. She succeeded where others had not. Now she's passing the torch, and we've got the second of two debates among those who would like to put their stamp on the party and country. Now, with 10 candidates vying for leader, we thought having them all go at it at once was just far too unwieldy. So we have divided the field into two parts. Joining us now for the second debate, five equally determined candidates. And here they are in alphabetical order. In Montreal, Quebec, Miriam Haddad, lawyer and the Green Party candidate in the last election in Chateauguay-Lacolle. 
in Yellowknife Northwest Territories, Courtney Howard, an emergency room physician and president of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. In Montreal, Quebec, Dimitri Lascaris, lawyer and the Green Party's 2015 candidate in London West. Also in Montreal, Quebec, Dylan Maxwell, eco-entrepreneur and a six-time candidate for the Green Party of Canada in Quebec. And in the nation's capital, there's Andrew West, lawyer and the party's justice critic who has run federally and provincially for the Greens. And we are delighted to welcome all of you, five candidates, for our second go-round on this. And let me just start by putting this premise out there, and we'll get into some discussion about it. When people think of the Liberal Party or the New Democratic Party or the Conservative Party, they, I suspect they have a sense about where on the political spectrum those parties live. I'm not sure that's the case with the Greens. And anyway, with a new leader coming in place, maybe you want to take the party somewhere else anyway. So let's have a bit of a conversation about that. Miriam, where do you see the Green Party of Canada being on that political spectrum? Well, uh, I, I, I think we are the most progressive party. And uh, we are a, grass, a true grassroots party. Um, all our policies are decided by the members, and um, we did some mistakes during the last uh, election. We just got to communicate our message and identity better. And um, if our slogan, our slogan needs to be aligned with our left-wing platform. Courtney Howard, where do you see the party? You know, probably not surprisingly, I see everything through the lens of health. So I think the Green Party has the potential to be the most evidence-based voice in Canada, the most ethics-driven voice, and the most action-oriented voice. And I think we'll make the most progress if we set a well-being economy and the overall health and well-being of Canadians as our sort of central vision. So solutions come from the left, from the right, from the center, wherever. Is that it? I just want people to live long and be happy. Gotcha. Dimitri Lascaris, how about you on that question? <coughs> I think we should, and by the way, I'd just like to start by acknowledging that I'm on the unceded land of Ganingahaga people here in Montreal. Thank you for having us on, Steve. Um, I think we really have to answer that question by reference to the core values of the party. And the core values of the party, there are six of them. We, many Canadians know about ecological wisdom and sustainability, which has always been the focus of our party, but we also uh, embrace its core values social justice, participatory democracy, nonviolence, and respect for diversity. And these, to me, embody uh, a progressive platform, a progressive vision. Call it the left, call it socialism, call it, uh, you know, uh, more left of center, whatever it may be. That is the core of who we are. We are not fundamentally, when you look at our core values, a centrist party. We're certainly not a party of the right. And I think we should be proud of that fact. And I, I readily embrace it. Dylan Maxwell. Well, I think we have to use compassion and logic to make our decisions. We can't just jump to, to one decision or another based on whether it fits into being a socialist or, or right wing. Um, for example, you know, drug policy, you look at Portugal, it works. You know, somebody on the right might go, oh, no, it's uh, legalizing drugs. We don't want to do that. Well, does it work or does it not work? We have to focus on, on what works, and we don't want to turn people off. I think in Quebec, being a socialist party would help us, but I think in the rest of the country, and I think people understand that, we shouldn't lock ourselves in. If we turn always turn left, we're going to go around in circles. If we always turn right, we're going to go around in circles. There's a lot of great ideas, like stopping there being billionaires and stuff like that, but how do you do that? You have to look at the actual facts and what's going to work and what's not going to work, and, and have compassion. Andrew West. Uh, first, I just wanted to clarify one point that was set off the top. I'm actually not in Ottawa right now. Uh, when the pandemic started, I actually, my wife and I packed up our condo so we could come to Owen Sound to make sure that my mother was taken care of during this time. So I'm actually in Owen Sound, Ontario, north of Toronto right now. Beautiful area. Beautiful. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I think that I'm a moderate and I, I, am pro I am an advocate for a thriving Canada. I think that the Green Party is in the centre. I think that we are a party that has strong social economic policies, but I think we've also been a party that has shown that we are fiscally responsible and we can't lose that. I think if we shift the party towards the left, which a lot of people want to, a lot of candidates want to do, then we're going to have more candidates fighting over a smaller piece of the pie. If we want to get elected, and that should be the goal of the Green Party, is to get elected, then we need to stay in the center and attract votes who a disenfranchised voters who are fed up with the NDP and the Liberals, but also conservative voters who feel like the Conservative Party has lost their way, especially when it concerns the environment and fiscal responsibility. 
we should be that option to attract all of these voters. We're a big tent party, and we need to attract as many voters as we can to win. Okay, that establishes where the five of you are in terms of the vision on the political spectrum for the future of the party. Let's now talk about the thing that I'm sure is on everybody's mind who intends to participate in this leadership contest, and that is pollution. The skies, the environment. Look at the skies of our major cities. They are cleaner than they've been in years. That may be one of the very few things that this pandemic has delivered to us. However, uh, here comes the question. We want to take that positive development of cleaner skies and run with it. However, we are also being told that it's likely that people are not going to come back to public transit in the way they once did, and therefore people may drive more. We know when people go shopping nowadays, uh, they're using single-purpose plastic bags again. The reusable bags, we're told not to bring them. Uh, we may see in the future some things that seem very unenvironmental in order to deal with the times in which we live. So let's start with this. Courtney Howard, you start us off on this. How do we take advantage of the good things of this moment and really make transformational change? So I think what COVID has shown us is number one, we need to pay deep attention to the intersection between human health and the health of the rest of the natural world. This virus started in animals and made its leap into humans. And we've seen other similar viruses, much of it driven uh, by biodiversity loss. And we know that as the climate changes, we're gonna see animals changing in habitat and it actually increases the risk of further pandemics just like this. So I view the coronavirus crisis as a planetary health emergency and in fact the biggest reason we've ever had to take action on climate change and in reconcile our relationship with the natural world. So I think that what we've seen, the good part, is that when we work together and take action and our scientists are able to inform our policy in a really direct way, we can change the world really fast. And so when we see these pictures of, you know, the uh, streets in Toronto and the clean air, I think that that can be a vision that can help us envision a positive future that we can move towards. Sometimes in the environmental movement, we've been not very good at painting where we want to go. We've been too busy scaring people about where we don't want to go. And so to me, this is a sign that we can sort of take hope from to say, hey, when we work all together, we can get the job done. And we know that, for instance, traffic-related air pollution in Toronto is responsible for about 20% of new pediatric asthma exacerbation. So if we can maintain this kind of good air quality, that keeps kids out of hospital, that saves healthcare costs, that reduces lung cancer, people live longer. So there's a lot of good reasons for us to do this that will help us keep us safe now, reduce healthcare costs, and keep our kids safe into the future. Overall, the thing we need to do is have a wholehearted vision of a healthy society. And the way we put that into law is with the Climate Accountability Act here in Canada. We've had such piecemeal policy with one party getting elected and then another party getting elected and completely changing things. We haven't made any progress. In the UK, where they brought the Climate Change Act in about 10 years ago, they've managed to reduce their emissions substantially. So we, we need to pass a law, legislate, um, greenhouse gas carbon budgets every five years. We need an independent scientific advisory body that continuously audits government policy and feeds back whether or not we're going to make our target or not so that people can adjust on the go. So really, okay. I think this Dr. is about Howard, I'm gonna having jump in. a vision and moving towards our vision. Gotcha. Okay. Dimitri Lascaris, why don't you pick that up and tell us how you'd handle this moment? Well, I think the lesson of this moment, uh, amongst many others, is that government must lead and government can lead. We have been told for decades that the means were not there to fund a rapid transition uh, to a renewable energy economy. And yet we've discovered, lo and behold, that when a pandemic erupts and our government was ill prepared for that, frankly, the government is able to summon tens of billions of dollars, even hundreds of billions of dollars to deal with the crisis of the moment. And I think that we as Greens can all agree that in the longer term, the climate emergency is an even greater threat to the existence of humanity and to the livability of our planet than this particular pandemic. So if we have the means to deal with massive government, by means of massive government intervention with this crisis, surely we have the means to do that with respect to a much more uh, pressing long-term uh, crisis, and that is the climate crisis. So I would say that we now know that this myth that the means are not there is in fact a myth. Uh, and I call upon the government, and as a leader of the Green Party of Canada, I will champion the notion that the government 
should come forward with a massive investment plan to transition to a renewable energy economy and to learn the lessons of the economic realities of, of, of the situation. And I just want to say one thing in response to a comment by uh, my brother Dylan in, in his opening remarks about what constitutes a moderate and not a moderate. In my opinion, we need to stop talking about persons who are ultimately defending the status quo as moderates. If you have a status quo that is leading you down the path of extinction, ultimately, that's extremism. The people who are the true moderates in this race are those who are calling upon this country and this party to take the steps necessary to deal with a fundamentally flawed economic system that is leading us down the path of climate crisis. Okay, Dylan, over to you. Well, first of all, I wouldn't call myself a moderate, though I do think we have to have public support. We have to have democracy. People can vote online for particular issues because we need public support for the radical things we need to do. Um, and uh, in terms of, of COVID, we need, the problem is still here. We need to take care of it. And, you know, you should ask not what the Green Party can do to, for you, but what you can do for the planet and for your fellow Canadians. So I'm giving away a uh, free, free mask. You can contact me and I'll give you a free mask if you donate to uh, the campaign at uh, greenparty.ca backslash capital X, capital D, capital D. One quarter of the money I, I uh, collect goes to um, giving out free masks to people. Another quarter goes to actually burying carbon in the ground. You can check that out at uh, carbonface.ca. Um, we have to do things. We have to act. The government did not. They had a chance. You know, I think this shows what happens, what the difference the government makes in people's lives. Um, you know, if we, if we accept science, we all knew a pandemic was coming. Trudeau decided, like most countries, just to go on, do business as usual, think about what we're doing today, how we can make more money today. But Taiwan, they had less than seven deaths because they listened to the science, they knew what was coming, coming, and they prepared, just like we could have done, um, but we didn't do. And it's the same thing with climate change. We know what's coming. We need to prepare. We're going to do much better economically if we prepare and we start doing things now. But, but we shouldn't talk of things in this left and right thing. It's, you know, we should be focusing, focusing on a gro growth global happiness, not about money. Sure, it's hard to be happy when you don't have a good place to live, when you don't have food. But by focusing on, on, on money, we're, we're looking at the wrong issues. You know, we sure we need shelter, sure we need some clothing, uh, but we're all doing pretty, no, we're not all doing pretty well here. But I mean, we, we have to think about what's important and not divide ourselves between what's left and right. We have to think about things. We have to do things like as an opposition, we have to propose policies that everyone can get behind, like having you know, one income tax rather than six in terms of, you know, when you hire people. I used to hire people and they make it so complicated. And I was like, I'll sweep up myself. I don't want to fill up all this paperwork. Okay, hopefully we'll have a chance. Hopefully we'll, we'll have a chance to discuss some of these ideas as we go along here. Andrew West, how would you respond to this particular moment in our history where we're making some environmental progress, ironically because of the pandemic, but it may also cause some non-environmental responses as well? Well, I don't necessarily think that we can't go back to the way things were before, where we started to transition away from single-use plastics, such as garbage bag or sorry, sorry, as shopping bags and straws. And I think that obviously during the pandemic, some of those measures needed to be in place to go back to those shopping bags because people were concerned about bringing the virus in on canvas bags. But I think what this pandemic has shown is that when we put our minds to it, we can address the climate change, we can address the climate issues, and we can reach our Paris Accord target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 30% below what they were in 2005 by 2030. So it's not a matter of fact that, you know, people are going to get upset and they're scared to go back on public transit. We've developed a system in the past. People have learned that they need to use more reusable bags. They need to use more public transit. And now that I see that, given the right circumstances, humans can make a difference and a positive impact on our environment, I think that that's a sign that we should focus on and move forward and say, look, if we take what we've already learned before and we take what we've learned now, then we can put those together and transition into a greener economy that will truly benefit society long term. And I just want to go back, actually question something that, that um, Dimitri said, I think he was actually referring to me when he was talking about being a moderate, because yes, I am. And unfortunately, we do need to look at our finances. The Green Party is in an amazing situation right now. After, if you look at through a history, after traditional years of um, deficits, usually brought on by liberal parties, they've often turned to the Conservative Party thinking that they need to do this to 
control our debt to GDP ratio. So for example, in 2007, our debt to GDP ratio was 67%. Now it's around 90%. Healthy economies like Germany stay around that 80% or that 60% range. If we utilize this opportunity properly, we can be shown as the party that Canadians can turn to in this hard economic times. Deficits are important in a time like this, but they weren't necessarily needed in the past four years. And if you look at the, G the GDP ratio graphs, you can see a spike over the last years of the federal liberal government. People are going to be turning for a fiscally responsible option. The Conservative Party have proven ever since um, Stephen Harper that they are not there for the environment. They have failed the environment. We need to be ready and available for Canadians who care about fiscal responsibility and also care about the planet. Okay, and that's given, the most responsible option. Given that you mentioned Dimitri in your answer there, I should give him a chance to respond, and then I want to get Miriam on the original question that I asked. Go ahead, Dimitri. Thanks, Steve. I was itching to respond. Uh, I'm so glad that that, uh, that Andrew, my colleague, raised the whole question about Germany and fiscal responsibility. In fact, Germany has shown an unhealthy and irrational obsession with uh, fiscal deficits. Japan, which is also a healthy economy and which is paying rock bottom interest rates, has a debt to GDP ratio in order in excess of 200 percent, far in excess of Canada's debt to GDP ratio. A country that has control of its own currency that is as wealthy as Canada, that has a highly educated population and bountiful natural resources and a, a, a fundamentally stable political and legal system, has the ability to invest to a far greater degree than we have. And it, you want to talk about fiscal responsibility. Is balancing a budget when you need to invest billions upon billions of dollars in a green transition fiscally responsible? I think that's fiscally uh, irresponsible, frankly. I think you make yeah. the investments that are needed to minimize the long-term costs of this extraordinary damage to our civilization from the climate emergency. And if we have to borrow heavily to do that at rock bottom interest rates or interest free from the Bank of Canada, which we have the legal capacity to do, I support that 100%. I think we should start asking ourselves what actually is fiscal responsibility because there's a real problem out there in our understanding of what that is. Okay, let me get up to Miriam. I think you're framing, I think, sorry, if I may just real quick. Andrew, very briefly. I think you're framing this. I think you're framing the question wrong, and I'll be very, very quick. The fact of the matter is, people, we, if we're not going to be fiscally responsible, then the fact is, is people just aren't going to vote for that sort of party. And we can be fiscally responsible, fiscally responsible and protect the environment. For example, cutting all sorts of subsidies for the oil and gas industry and the tar sands, not paying for the Trans Mountain Pipeline. There's so many other ways that we can be fiscally responsible and protect our environment. That's the vision that I see for the Green Party. Okay, gentlemen, I'm going up to Miriam now because Miriam still needs a chance to respond to the original question about taking advantage of this transformational moment in time in spite of everything. Go ahead, Miriam. Well, people will vote for, for, uh, for people that have the political courage to stand up for Canadians. So while we saw a drop in air pollution during COVID-19, it wasn't enough. It shows that we need structural change. We need to make working from home more accessible with low cost speed internet for everyone. We need to make sure that our grid all goes all across the country is green. We need to move away from petrol. We are one of the highest users as well as exporters. We have also seen that rapid change is possible. The Canadian government was able to quickly distribute funds to make sure that people were able to live. We have now seen that if they wanted to act on climate change, they can start straight away. Okay, Miriam, let me stay with you for this. Let me stay with you for this next question, because uh, I think public opinion polls showed after the last federal election that the public thought that the Liberals and New Democrats in particular had something good and useful to say about the environment, the Conservatives less so. But it does raise the question of whether or not they have become green enough to make the Green Party redundant in Canada. Maybe we don't need it anymore. What's your view on that? Well, uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe so at all. Um, first of all, the Liberals are just not able to keep their promises on the environment. Uh, the NDP, um, you know, just to let you know, the NDP uh, in BC, the provincial uh, NDP, is, um, uh, just gave a permit to mine coal. Coal in 2020. A lot of progressives and socialists do not recognize themselves in the NDP anymore. And what we need to make sure is that Social justice should be at the core of every single one of our policies. 
and the environment and the climate crisis, it goes hand in hand with, with um, uh, social justice. So um, yes, we, we need the Greens and the Greens can win. Courtney Howard, do you think the other parties are green enough to render you redundant at this moment? Well, I asked a lot of people that question before deciding to run and, and pretty much the smartest people I could find in Canada and the overwhelming answer was we're very much important. And we see that just because of how, you know, the liberals, although they have done good things like bring a carbon price in and they've done good work on coal phase out, you know, they bought a pipeline. And so and we're just not seeing the uh, targets that we need. We're not seeing the overall accountability uh, legislation that we need. And so, yes, I think it's super important that we have an evidence based, really ethics driven voice just laying down the bottom line and pulling us towards um, the action we need to take to keep today's kids safe. Sheldon, let's keep that five shot up there. We did this with the last group and I want to do it with this group as well. Is there anyone among the five of you that would agree to build more pipelines in this country going forward? Anybody want a show of hands on that one? Okay, we got five no's. We had five no's the last time, so we're just confirming that all 10 candidates are against further pipeline building. All right, Dylan, why don't we get you to weigh in on this issue of whether or not we actually still need a Green Party in this country? Well, Trudeau wants to do the right thing, but he doesn't have the guts. Um, we, need, we need people who are willing to, to look outside the box and, and uh, do things differently, like I think we should do in, in terms of uh, the next election, which is set up a map where people can uh, actually look at the writing they're in. Because, you know, I think we lose 70% of our votes to people who, who think they're voting strategically, but are not voting strategically. Because in most of the writings, everyone knows who's going to win or not. Well, they don't know, but if you look at it, they'll know. And then we got to support the NDP and the Liberals in, in the writings where it makes sense. In Pacific writings, doesn't mean we don't run a candidate. And that way, we can ensure the, end, the Conservatives never get back into power unless they do the, the right thing and support proportional representation. Uh, they, they got the most votes in the last election, and they didn't win. If that happens enough, they, they will change their mind and, like the NDP, uh, support um, a different electoral system. Well, since um, you brought up proportional the, representation, let me move to uh, Dimitri and ask him about that, because in the last federal election, the Greens did get 6.6% .6 of the votes, but that was good for three seats. Mm -hmm. The Bloc got literally 1% more vote than the Greens, and they didn't get three seats. They got 32 <laughs> seats. So we have a system that tends to punish parties that do not have an efficient vote. I'd like to know, and I know everybody says, let's bring in PR, proportional representation, but it's not going to happen. And I'd like to know, um, how, how do you make an appeal to the public to vote for you when so many of them think that voting for you is a wasted vote? Right. So, you know, there's no doubt in anybody's mind in the Green Party of Canada that the electoral system we have is fundamentally anti-democratic and that it has caused us uh, enormous prejudice. Our party would have had, you know, seat in Parliament back in uh, the late 80s under a true proportional representation system. We would have been official party status by about 2004 under a true proportional representation system. Nobody has suffered more from this than we have. And we have every reason to continue to argue strongly and passionately for electoral reform. But you are quite right, Steve. This government, which promised, Justin Trudeau promised approximately 1,800 times to make first the, the 2015 election the last election under first past the post, we can't rely upon them to change the system for us. And we certainly can't rely upon the Conservatives to do that. We're going to have to find a way to get sufficient presence in Parliament and sufficient leverage to actually bring or force electoral form onto the legislative agenda. By our calculations, the calculations of my campaign team, we need about 35 seats to do that. I think the path to do that, I mean, remember that the NDP in the first past the post system actually formed the official opposition from I think about 2011 to 2015. We can do that and we can do better under first past the post despite the enormous challenges. But to do that, we have to unite progressives across this country who I believe and polling data clearly show constitute a majority in this country. We have to speak to them by not only talking about the environmental crisis, the climate emergency, but also talking about workers' rights, talking about the crisis of inequality in this country, talking about racism in this country. There is systemic racism in this country, and we need to put forward a, blow, a bold platform to deal with that. We can unite all the progressives in this country under the Green Party banner. That opportunity is there. 
And I, 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 for one, plan to make that a hallmark of my leadership if I'm given the privilege of leading this party. We are going to talk about racism for our next question, but I'd first like to get Andrew and, and the rest to weigh in on this issue of, of how you try to remain relevant and, and appeal to people for votes when they know that if they give you, you know, even 10 percent of the vote, it doesn't translate into very many seats at all. Andrew, you want to come in on that? So the Green Party is extremely relevant and now so are more, more than ever. I think one of the things that we need to do first is change the narrative. And Steve, actually, maybe you as a member of the media can help with this. And that's actually to look at the actual term strategic voting. It's not strategic. An actual strategy would be to think about the party that you want to have elected and then do everything you can to help get that party elected, even if it means voting for them two or three or four in successive elections. Voting simply for one party to stop another party is out of is fear. It's fear voting. That's it. There's no strategy. There's no strategy in just picking the opposite party just to block a party. So we need to change that narrative. We need to make sure that our EDAs across Canada are stronger so we can help spread the word that we are a relevant party and we're ready to govern and to make sure that when the next election comes, we have a strong pan campaign set on the ground level to get going. Courtney Howard, what's the appeal? So I think the thing that we need to remember is all of the people who don't vote because they're completely disenchanted with just the tenor of political discussion, the sort of fighting. I think those are the people that we can excite. If we say, hey, you know, we're in a bad way. We know we're vulnerable. We know you're scared. But this is the path to safety. We need to solve COVID and climate at the same time. We need to change the way we target our overall vision to a well-being based economy. We're going to support that by stabilizing our ecological foundation. We're going to keep people safe with a universal basic income. We're going to build the world together. The you want your kids to inherit. People will come out and vote. I think we have a moment. People are so vulnerable and we have the best opportunity to provide a really optimistic unifying vision, and that's how we're going to get in. And after we get those seats, that's when we will pass a uh, proportional representation system. Miriam, I'd like to get you on that. You know, if you don't come first or second in our first past the post system, it really punishes you, and the Greens know that better than anybody. What would you do about it? You know, um, I really believe, I strongly believe in proportional representation, but that we still need to inspire young people to vote for us. And that is going to be with political courage. Um, you know, also the, uh, the the example that you chose between the Bloc and the Greens, it's, it, it's a false example to use because we got 6% over 338 writings and the Bloc did on 78 writings only. And um, we give uh, we need to give people the chance to vote for the best party rather than the least worst option. And we need to make to be really, really clear on what we stand for. Okay, we've got less than 10 minutes to go here, and we do need to talk about uh, what is clearly, um, you know, there are three issues in our society right now, basically, the pandemic, the economic devastation as a result of it, and anti-black racism, which uh, th this is a real moment in our history to deal with this issue. And Dimitri, you raised the issue of racism a second ago, so I wonder if you'd start us off mm. in a bit of a discussion about whether the words defund the police, what they mean to you, and what you would do about it. Yeah, this unfortunately, Steve, has generated some uh, confusion. I, I'm not a big fan of that phrase because it, it only talks about one half of the equation. One half of the equation is reducing funding per, for police, but it doesn't communicate what is going to happen with the money that is saved by reducing funding for police. A better phrase would be reallocation of police funding because that money should be taken to address the root causes of what our society has determined to be criminality. The root causes to a very large degree, or an overwhelming degree, are social injustice, uh, poverty, homelessness, mental health crises, uh, substance abuse. And the police is like, uh, a, a, it's a means whereby our society deals with the symptoms of the underlying causes of what we call criminality, but it doesn't deal with the, with the root causes. So I would say we need to reallocate resources from the police. I'm enthusiastically in favor of doing that towards social services, uh, supporting people who are suffering from substance abuse, from people who are in mental health crises, and, and, and really getting at the root problems of the behaviors that the police are uh, dealing with far too often in this country in a brutal and in a racist way. And, you know, I, I, I can't, I, I, I must stress once again that there is an enormous overrepresentation of Indigenous persons 
and black persons in our correctional system, incarcerated in the prisons around this country. The, you know, for example, indigenous persons, over 30% of inmates in correctional institutions are indigenous and they constitute less than 5% of the population. As a lawyer who has litigated on behalf of the disadvantaged for virtually my entire career, I can tell you that there's only one rational explanation for this incredible disparity between incarceration rates and population rates, and that is systemic racism. Okay, That's let me what make we sure. have in this country. Let's get everybody else in here on this one as well. Miriam, um, defund you. the police. What does it mean to you, and would you do it? Well, you know, defund the police, I think it really resonates, and it is it is what people are asking uh, in the streets. Um, so the Black Lives Matter movement, but there's also the Indigenous Lives uh, uh, Matter movement that we need to talk about. Uh, so we need to recognize the violence towards our Indigenous, uh, to, uh, towards indigenous communities. Uh, the RCMP was created uh, specifically to move uh, indigenous people into re onto reserves. So if you have a um, an institution that was created specifically for that, uh, it cannot be reformed in any way. So it needs to be uh, defunded and reinvested in into the communities. And it could be invested in affordable housing. It could be access to free pharmacare, safe injection sites. Uh, there are many ways uh, to, to reinvest in the communities, to get out people from out of poverty. Uh, this is how you uh, live in a more just society when we need to think about everybody like that. It's, it's, uh, it's something that, um, uh, you know, like it's, 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 it's really, and it's defunding the police. It's not only just defunding it, but it's also a road to abolition because this would be the, uh, the end of it. Can I understand what you're saying? You believe in abolishing the police altogether? Of course, but it's on the long run. Of course. Over what period of time? I wouldn't be able to tell you. I'm not saying that there wouldn't be any security or the police wouldn't be, um, um, th there wouldn't be any existence uh, of, uh, of a uh, uh, safety to people. But defunding the police, what it means, it's a road to abolition. All right, understood. Dylan Maxwell, where are you on this issue of defund the police? Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a good idea, and I think you uh, to, to at least start down that road as much as possible. I think you, for any problem, you, need, you should look around the world and see what works. So like in, Port in uh, Portland, Oregon, I think 17% of the money from the police or something like this went to um, people with actual uh, deep training in psychological issues. And uh, it's working out quite well. In New Jersey, they got rid of the whole police force. It's sort of more community-based force. And the crime went down by something like 50%. You have to look at, at what has worked in other places and come up with new ideas. So one of my ideas is for the police to, to give $20 to every person of color they stop. Um, this would uh, compensate a little bit to the uh, trauma and inconvenience of being stopped. And it would make the police think twice before, before they uh, stop them. Uh, we, we do have a, a huge problem, and, you know, the police need to be uh, trained better. And, you know, it's not as bad as in the States, but, you know, the police, they, they collect money, um, and the money often goes back to them. Um, and it's really, you know, the type of people get into policing in the first place. There's a lot of good police people, but there's also people uh, who, who feel, well, this is a place uh, they can beat people up. I remember in high school, this person wanted a bribe from me to join the DJ club. And lo and behold, you became a police officer. What a surprise. Hmm. You know, we have to weed these people out. Courtney Howard? We have to do everything we can. Courtney Howard, your view on defund the police. So I agree with Dimitri that I think that this is most helpfully framed as redistributing resources. Um, you know, I'm a frontline worker and I have been for a long time in small emergency departments in the North. The RCMP keep us safe. There have been many moments in my life where people have been in danger and I've been very happy to see them arrive. But just as we found in healthcare after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendations came out and we looked at the studies that said, you know, showed, hey, if you show up in an emergency department in uh, Canada with chest pain, you're a lot more likely to get an angiogram if you're not Indigenous than if you are. We need to develop increased insight into the systemic racism and the unconscious bias that we have. And I was disturbed by some of the comments from the RCMP leadership in the last little while that seemed to not indicate um, an appreciation of that. I have most definitely witnessed systemic racism within Canadian healthcare uh, structures as well as within RCMP behavior. And so I think that restorative justice Justice is a way of changing the power differential and bringing in some Indigenous land healing practices that could be much more 
uh, helpful for people in the long run. And I think that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of de-escalation training and community-based work. Andrew West. Well, this is an area that I'm definitely more in line with Dimitri. Um, I think it's a positive step that organizations like the RCMP acknowledge that systemic racism exists, which it does, and they actually have just recently acknowledged that. I think that once that's acknowledged, then you can start to find solutions that will better help society, all members of our society. I do think that police officers put themselves into dangerous situations and they do need resources to make sure that they are protected. But I think it's clear that different resources are needed for different situations. And for me, a great example is what, an unfortunate example is what happened recently with Regis Kurczynski Parquet. Um, it was a situation where her mother called asking for help because her daughter just had some epileptic episodes and had some mental issues. Now, I'm in favor of reallocating resources to the department to better have um, equipment and resources for situations to deal with matters like that. And I think that those situations dealing, doing that will help benefit society as a whole. And I think the Green Party also has great issues in addressing poverty, which is another element that needs to be addressed, as others have mentioned. And we have, we're, the bigger, we're probably the biggest proponent of any party for a guaranteed livable income. And I think that a guaranteed livable income is a win-win. I've obviously talked about fiscal responsibility. And if you look at the city of Ottawa, when it comes to, for example, making sure that people have proper housing, well, it's often cheaper to pay for a bed in social housing than it is to pay for a bed in a hospital or in a jail, which for a lot of people sometimes can be the only alternative. Mm -hmm. So these are the win-win situations that I look for and that I see the Green Party addressing. Okay, we are Sorry. literally down, forgive me everybody, we're down to our last minute, and I have to give it to Miriam because they tell me in the control room that she has had the least speaking time so far, and I wanna be fair. So Miriam, finish off on this. So what's the all, go ahead you you take the sorry, last word I, I gotta address whatever was said because like mr percival maxwell i gotta admit your 20 dollars solution is, is super racist and as a person of, of color i find it very very offensive also like what if you you want to pay people to address systemic racism it, it does nothing uh, what would be the next step if, if the person gets beaten up we give them 50. no like I, I want that's not I, what I, I want. I, I, I want to just stop Sorry. people from it's calling that, please. It's my minute, right? It's my minute. Go ahead. Also, concerning, concerning the UBI, um, uh, we need to, yeah, the UBI is great, but we need to maintain our uh, uh, social safety net. Uh, so that's uh, important to mention also. Okay. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, tout le monde. Uh, thanks to the five of you, Miriam Haddad, Courtney Howard, Dimitri Lascaris, Dylan Maxwell, Andrew West. We're so glad you could join us for our Green Party debate here on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Steve. Well, last night we did.